Well, I was getting beat up almost every day in eighth grade in high school. It was, it was the worst experience possible I was having in my life. And lo and behold, it was a godsend. They called me and they said, Oliver, we want to do the sequel for Poltergeist. And I said, yes, anything to get me out of school. Coming from the first Poltergeist, I was spoiled. Um, Toby and Steven said, told me I could pretty much say anything I wanted to say. They said, just be a kid. Do what you would do on set. Well, I came back to Poltergeist 2 with that kind of the same philosophy. And Brian was extremely talented and had a vision that he was going after. And he wanted me to do that vision. And sometimes that's where we came into conflict. He wasn't ready for me to add little lines and change things out and things like that. And as a filmmaker, I understand you want to be, you know, extremely specific in terms of what you want your talent to do because you can't have him running rough shot. Um, at the end of the day, he did a, a fantastic job and he did have a vision. And being a filmmaker, I completely respect what he was trying to do. And I feel for him knowing what I know now as a filmmaker. And uh, I think that he did everything he needed to do to make the movie he wanted to make. Poltergeist 2 was shot in an area called Altadena, which is part of Southern California. And it's a, a suburb, and my understanding is they shoot a lot of movies there. And like all productions, they showed up and just took over the entire neighborhood. And it was like this beautiful craftsman house that we shot at with this wonderful like backyard. I had a great time. I love going, working on movies as a kid and, and running in the neighborhood because it becomes like camp. You show up and you basically you take over and you can do anything you pretty much want. You can run around and you get food and you party with everyone and the neighborhood joins in and they kind of celebrate your arrival for the most part. Get her out of the park! Can't we get a TV like everybody else? No, no, we can't get a TV. Craig always kept things so lighthearted on the set. I remember we were covering molasses and gook and all this stuff, and Craig would just crack jokes. It says, just another night in Simi Valley. And it kept everything very lighthearted. And I don't know if a lot of people know this. He was a writer before he was an actor. So he had amazing ad-libs, great lines, and he was very inspirational. And he kept things on the set just very lighthearted for all of us. Grandma passed away last night. Grandma died? Jo Beth was wonderful, and I needed her more than really anyone. I had very little experience moving in the Poltergeist. I had done a fertilizer commercial, and that was pretty much it. That was the extent of my skilled acting level at that point. So I really turned to Jo Beth as a maternal figure. I, you know, I asked Jo Beth, what do I do here? And she'd say, okay, this is, she talked to me about the scene and she said, we're gonna run in place, we're gonna get ready and we're gonna go in there. And, you know, and sometimes I didn't understand really what was going on. So she would take the time and just talk to me about the scene, talk about my character, talk about all the things that would make it work. And if I didn't really have someone like Jo Beth in the set, I don't know if Poltergeist might've been the movie that it is and Poltergeist 2 as well. Heather was like a sister to me. We played on the set, we'd play with our toys, we'd talk about life, as much as you could talk about life when you haven't experienced that much at nine years old. She was just a wonderful, sweet girl. And, you know, losing her, I, I think we've all lost someone very special. I remember on set, we all talked, we talked about what we were gonna be when we grow up. And she said, maybe I'll be president of the United States. Or, and then she said, I wanna make movies too. And we talked about directing her own films. You put these on me so I can be a ballerina with wings? Darling, you can be anything you want to be. You know, I think that she probably would have gone on and made her own films too. She was extremely bright and um, very inspirational for me growing up. And she used to come to my house and used to hang out and talk about movies and talk about poltergeist. And I know she had a you know, wonderful relationship with Steven. And Steven, like with me, 
um, would have given her the opportunity to probably become a filmmaker. And Stephen gave me a, a Super 8 camera to go start shooting with. And I know she was talking to him about that too. What are you doing? Well, hi, Mom. I'm going to help protect the family now. Let me see. I didn't really did have much opportunity to work with Will Sampson, other than really on set. He was a very quiet man, a very he internalized everything. When you looked into Sam's eyes, he always looked like he was looking beyond the great unknown. And there was so much depth there. And I'd study him, and I'd say, well, I wonder what Sam is thinking about here, too. And we really didn't exchange many words. But what we did talk about, it seemed like we were speaking not in tongues, but almost like another language, just through our feelings and emotion, too. There was a certain level of depth that I felt that he had, even at 14 years old. And I, I really wish I could go back in time now and, and talk to him about what he was feeling. Um, because he probably just saw me as just some kid at that time. And I didn't really have appreciation for a lot of things that he did. Taylor, where the hell were you? We're not safe here anymore. My son almost dies and you sit here. I was protecting Carol Ann. It's her he's after, <laughs> not Robbie. I'm contending, I guess, with a whole new set of problems. Uh, before, in the first one, obviously, I had to deal with a clown doll that was attacking me and a tree. I moved on to bigger things, uh, prepubescent problems like braces attacking you. <coughs> What's interesting about that is they originally wanted me to be attacked by bees, but it turned out I was allergic to bees, so we switched gears over to the braces attacking me. So that was my major issue at that time, uh, having braces attack me. They told me I was gonna have braces and I was kind of freaked out it, honestly, because I had never worn them. I had no idea how I was gonna say my lines. So if they said, this is what we're gonna do, Oliver. We're gonna give you simulated braces. We're gonna have you go out and have a retainer made that looks like braces. So they gave me this retainer and then pretty much like a, a week before shooting, uh, they said, okay, do you, have you worked with your retainer? Do you know how to see your lines? And I literally had a list like this. I, I couldn't say the lines because I, I couldn't speak like with it. And they're like, Oliver, you have to learn to speak with your retainer. So I went to an acting coach. Believe it or not, there are acting coaches in Los Angeles that'll help you with pretty much anything. And I said, I have, I have a list now and I can't speak with the retainer. What do I do? So we worked on it. I overcame my speech impediment and I learned to speak with my retainer. Unfortunately on set, I didn't realize, but you can't eat food with a retainer. But there are a lot of scenes where we're actually eating food. So I actually had to learn to eat food with the retainer while saying my line. So you're juggling all these balls. Uh, so the simple became really complicated. But, you know, with movie magic and perseverance, I got through it. And, um, and that's why ADR existed, because I think I ended up ADRing a lot of those lines. And you have to remember, for the braces scene, this is long before they had CGI effects. So everything in this movie was practical. So this is how they did it. They said, Oliver, okay, this is what we want you to do. We went to Boss Films, and I met Richard Adelaide, and he said, explain exactly how they're going to do it. He says, we're going to animate the braces coming out of your mouth. And I said, that's interesting. How are you going to do that? And I learned soon enough. They made a mold on my head. They dripped this plaster on my head. And I was like, that's cool, but how am I going to breathe? And they said, oh, that's, we have it all figured out for you. You're going to breathe out of these little straws. We're going to put straws in your nose, and um, you're going to be able to breathe. So don't worry. You won't suffocate at all. And I was like, what if the straws come out? What if it drips over my nose? So I said, no, no, no. We'll keep the passages clear. You'll be just fine. And I was. So they made the mold of my head, and then they made this little, like, I guess a device that kind of had my mouth kind of shaped on it, and they had the braces, just the first part of the scene where they pull the braces out. And so I put that on my mouth and I had to emote with that. Then they intercut that with different moments, I guess, uh, that a time sequence where it's showing this is the first section where they cut away where the braces first attack me. Then they have me up on the ceiling. So I believe that's how they actually did the braces scene from my 14 year old perspective of that entire sequence. I thought it looked really good. I think it looked, I think in a lot of ways it probably looks better than what they would do today because it is practical, it is real. When we did the flying sequences of Poltergeist 2, um, I had no experience whatsoever with that. It was actually an incredibly tedious and I, you know, I would say painful experience. And um, I really envy actors who are in special effect movies. You really gain a complete appreciation of what they have to go through. And how they did it with me is they gave me a harness 
And then this harness was like basically pretty much cutting into your skin. And they said, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna protect you all over. We're gonna give you lamb's wool in the, in the more sensitive places of your body. So I was wearing lamb skin. But the problem with it is once you get this contraption on, you can't really take it off. It takes like forever to take it off. So I had to learn really pretty much not to go to the bathroom for seven hours at a time too. And so what they did is they, they once you have this harness, they string you up they mount you, you know, you're flying on wires. And that part's really fun. I, I've never experienced anything quite like it before. I actually got the sensation of flying too. But, you know, you're dealing with a situation where, you know, no matter how much protection you have in those sensitive places, you're still really gonna feel it, especially when gravity is taking over and they're bringing you up in the air too. Uh, we were in harnesses for pretty much like two and a half weeks. Uh, so it felt like it was never gonna end too. Um, so I was really happy, I think, when the whole harness operation was completed, too. You know, and I'm a big believer, you know, as they say, life is temporary, film is forever, and it's really true. And, you know, this is what I tell my fellow filmmakers and actors, that, you know, we might have one moment of discomfort right now, but everything we're doing is going to be immortalized forever. And here we are, you know, 30 years later, we're talking about that sequence, so it was totally worth all the suffering. Did a lot of screaming on the set again and was just dealing with all the effects and and just you know it really helps heighten your acting abilities when they say that someone's waving a stick at you and saying what are we scared of and they say we don't know but just look at that stick and whatever's at the end of that stick is the scariest thing you can possibly think of after working on poltergeist 2 it helped me really grow up and see another side of the film industry from a really a more adult perspective i saw the difficulties i saw the challenges and it taught me a lot of lessons about life and how if you want to be, if you want to make movies, you have to be 110% committed to the effort because it is a very difficult process. Everything is going to be working against you, whether it's a business situation, in nature, or other things you just can't predict. So you have to truly love cinema. And I didn't see that on Poltergeist 1. For me, it was just camp. I was having the greatest time in the world. But I saw that, you know, making movies are really not easy and you're dealing with a lot of challenging elements and it gave me a lot of compassion for directors and producers and all the other people that make a film. So that's what I really took from Poltergeist 2. I really liked it. I think they, they executed what they wanted to do with the movie. And there's a lot of things I might have done differently now I'm looking back as a filmmaker. But you have to remember, coming off Poltergeist, that's a really hard story to do a sequel for. I think any movie like that, like a Back to the Future, it's like, where do you go with this plot? Where do you go with these characters? There's something that's actually compelling, but at the same time delivers on elements that you know your audience wants to see from original Poltergeist. So given all of those situations and what they're contending with, they really did you know, a fantastic job of telling the story. I remember people really liking it too. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, the internet really didn't exist then. So I just talked to my friends about it and they really loved it. And they said, we just loved you being in the movie again too. I think the bullies actually like seeing me in the movie as well too. Cause I just got to say, I beat up that kid that's acting in that movie. <laughs>